My name is Shauna Oltmans, and I'm the Exhibitions and Programs Manager at the International Spy Museum. Thank you for joining us tonight for our very first Spies and Spy Masters Happy Hour. Um, I don't know if you guys are feeling like me, a little bit stir crazy, um, looking for really anything to do. Um, so I hope you guys enjoy tonight, um, and thank you for uh, having a drink with us. Um, now we'll be taking questions. Uh, at the end of the program. So if you do have a question, uh, there should be uh, kind of like a question mark symbol um, on your screen somewhere. If you click that, you should be able to enter a question that way. Um, but let's get to the program. Uh, we are very lucky to have uh, Amanda Olke, who is the Director of Adult Education at the International Spy Museum. Uh, and she was the lead developer for the museum's current Matahari exhibit. So she is really the perfect person to be sharing this story of Matahari. But before we get to Amanda and Matahari, we are first gonna head on over to Stoney's on P Street, where Reese is whipping up the Matahari cocktail to help us get in the mood. So Reese, do you wanna take it away? Yes, hey guys, how y'all doing today? Uh, I'm Reese over here. We're going to start off with this martini. So first things first, you want to chill your martini glass. That is key. So I've already chilled mine, but you'll just take your martini glass, put a scoop of ice in it, and then follow up with some water. Leave it to the side. You'll take your shaker, fill that up with ice as well. We are going to use cognac. My cognac of choice is Hennessy. So you're going to take your Hennessy one and one fourth ounce follow wow <laughs> so when it goes by ounces the best way i mean a martini always has more alcohol in it i mean everyone knows that <laughs> um but then you'll use your sweet vermouth so we'll do an ounce of that followed by Freshly squeezed lemon juice. So it's three fourths lemon juice, which is probably just like one full lemon. And then we got simple syrup. We have an ounce, half ounce of that, followed by three fourths of pomegranate juice. And then you'll just shake it up. pour away i wish you guys could see me pour but oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and i'm gonna garnish this bad boy with some dried rose petals for fanciness oh <laughs> fancy cheers guys cheers, cheers. 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 oh that looks great well thank you so much reese for anyone in the uh, DC Logan Circle area, Sony's is open for pickup orders. So if you don't feel like cooking tonight, they've got you covered. Um, now, on to Amanda and Mata Hari. Wonderful, thanks everybody. There is a little bit on the back end of this that, that gives us some mystery when we're presenting, but I am so excited to talk to you tonight about the secrets of Mata Hari and to, to share a drink with you. I'm having a little uh, sparkling um, Blanc de Blanc that my dear friend Afua Nakwa, our PR person, gave me, and it is making my evening magical. All right, so this is the dearly beloved International Spy Museum that we miss, and I hope you visited, and if you haven't, um, or if you live far away, I hope when we reopen that you will come and see it. This is our gallery devoted to spies and spy masters, and we tell a number of intriguing stories about very different people uh, involved in um, human intelligence, in spying. And um, Matahari is, I think, if I don't say so myself, a rather gorgeous looking uh, display in the center of the gallery and you might have some idea either you know a lot about matahari or a little 
but I bet this is the kind of image you have of her in your mind, and that is correct. That is definitely one image of Matahari, and we are very proud to have one of her dance costumes. Believe We believe this is one that was worn by her. She um, danced all across Europe. She did um, very artistic, and the word at the time would have been oriental dances. They were inspired um, by Javanese dance. And um, so most of the photos, most of the time when we think about her, she is in some state of semi-undress and dancing. And you might have thought about her because of something you've seen in pop culture. Maybe you've seen this 1931 movie with Greta Garbo. And Greta Garbo was the biggest actress in the world at that time. This is a lot of fun. And boy, let me tell you, watching her do her version of Mata Hari's dances, you will never be the same again. Or maybe you're a silent film buff and you've seen this poster of the Red Dancer. Um, this film, we don't, I cannot find it. We don't think it exists anymore, but um, it's, we see this poster a lot. And then the, uh, the program, the sort of pale green document is in our collection and it has all these outtakes. Uh, from the film, and it's a guide um, in German to the film, so it's really cool to see. Maybe you played pinball on a Mata Hari themed game back in the 70s. Maybe you've played as Mata Hari on a video game. Or this is a really cool musical that uh, debuted in Korea in 2016, and um, it's been remounted several times. I don't speak Korean, but I have geeked out and enjoyed watching um, the pieces of the show I can find uh, online. Or, hey, maybe you're as old as I am and you saw the one season, the Lancelot Link secret chimp was on screen and his sidekick, Nada Harry. Isn't that hilarious? But anyway, no matter what, you probably think, of Mata Hari is looking something like this with her headdresses and her beads and her jewels. And not like this, because the truth is Mata Hari was um, a Dutch woman. Um, she wasn't Oriental at all. She was a woman who created herself. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit more about who she really was and her background and why we're still playing video games and thinking about her and watching Russian movie series about her to this day. Um, so as I said, she was Dutch. She had a, a childhood that was at first one of kind of privilege. Her dad was a successful um, person in mercantile business. Um, he lost his money. He divorced his wife. Mata Hari was um, sadly too attractive for her own good as a teenager. Um, she left school under a cloud because of a purported relationship with a, a teacher at school. And of course, in those days, it was her fault. Uh, now we might call it child abuse. I don't know, but she was at loose ends um, as, a, as an 18, uh, 19 year old. And she responded um, to an ad. I'm going to skip ahead and, and then go back. She responded to an ad in a Dutch newspaper for um, an officer home on leave who um, was looking for a nice woman to marry him. And that was Rudolph McLeod. And they had a very bad marriage. And um, what she did get out of it were, um, was a trip to um, the Dutch Indies, or not a trip, a time living there, and, and two children, um, and uh, probably a bad case of syphilis, and her children both died young, one very young, probably from congenital syphilis. Rudolph was incredibly jealous of her, he was incredibly abusive, it was terrible. She was only 19 when they married, by the mid-20s, they bounced back and forth between the Netherlands and what was that, you know, the Dutch, Indies or Java um, at the time. Um, finally, they came back to the Netherlands. The marriage fell apart. It was incredibly abusive. 
and um, and she wanted to, they had one child still surviving, her daughter, she wanted to have her daughter with her. Rudolph would give her very little support, really next to no financial support. Um, she was desperately trying to stay kind of a proper woman. She appeared on the Dutch stage, but alas, it was no good. And she fled to Paris in 1903. And she's quoted, she made light of all these things, although they were true, but as she created her persona, she said, oh, I thought all women who ran away from their husbands went to Paris. Well, when she got to Paris, she did want to, she continued to hope to stay reputable, as they would say. She always hoped to get her daughter back. Um, she was aware that she had a stunning physique. She was an artist model. She was athletic and she um, performed in um, an equestrian act in one of those um, cool French circuses that you see in the, the paintings by Degas and uh, Lautrec. But that did not catch fire. What caught fire for her was when Marguerite Zell became Mata Hari. Um, she drew upon her background living in, um, in the Indies. She had seen Javanese dancers and um, she was inspired by this. And she concocted this dance. There was a slight interest in these kind of oriental dances at the time, but nothing was as authentic as, as she aimed to be. Also, it definitely, um, the, a lot of the appeal were these very brief costumes. But Matahari was very slick and very savvy, and she partnered up um, with a collector, Monsieur Gumet, and he has this wonderful the Gumet Museum. Uh, please forgive my French pr uh, pronunciations. I'm sure they're the worst, but I'm doing my best. Um, and she launched her performance, her, her dance career in his gallery. So these, you see a lot of photos from um, from this night and these handmaidens around her, she's holding a spear and she was became very undraped as the evening progressed. It was an enormous hit, an enormous hit. And she understood that if she were describing this as a sacred dance, that her dance was a was a poem, um, that it was a temple dance, that people would feel more comfortable being uh, titillated by it and enjoying it. And she was really savvy. And she even said, you know, I, with every veil I threw off, my success grew. So she'd arrived in Paris in 1903. Um, this is her launch in 1905. Um, she becomes incredibly successful. But I wanted to show you another image of her from the same time period. This one's a little harder to see, but it's very cool. Um, this is Mata Hari again, and now she's if, at the same uh, Gumet Museum, but she's operating the Javanese shadow puppets. And so she really is interested in um, sharing this culture. Um, and it was kind of a creation between her and Gumet of how to promote Oriental culture. So she's very savvy and witting about what she's doing. And um, it's so cool. I've seen these puppets um, on loan at a museum in Holland. Um, such a thrill for a nerd. All right, she becomes incredibly famous. She dances on stages across Europe um, and she loves her fame and she keeps these really glorious scrapbooks with all kinds of articles and programs and advertisements. These are two of the scrapbooks you see on display on one side. Um, and the Fries Museum in Leeuwarden in the Netherlands where she uh, was born um, the Freeze has these scrapbooks and they very kindly let us uh, recreate some pages um, uh, from the scrapbooks that are in the exhibition. So I'm, I really want to thank them for, for letting us do that. So she's incredibly famous. She lives a very glamorous life and she loves to ride. Isn't it fun to see her in her clothes since we think she never wore any, but she loved fashion in there wonderful photographs of her in furs and feathers and the latest dresses and jewels and all of this costs money and um boy could she spend some money and at this point she had really of course given up all hope of having her daughter or being 
respectable. Now she's an artiste, she's a celebrity, and if gentlemen want to, you know, pay for spending time with her and pay for where she lived, she didn't mind if she did. Um, this is a, a letter from our collection at the Spy Museum. Gives you a little sense of, of what she's like. She's uh, kind of, I like to say, she's working the, the favor economy. Um, she is writing to the, um, the manager of the Monte Carlo Hotel, or sorry, she's writing to the manager of the Monte Carlo Opera on very fine stationery from the Hotel Metropole, which still exists today. And she's writing in March of 1908, and she's asking him to please set aside some tickets for her um, because she's sure he remembers when she performed there in the King of Lahore uh, a few years earlier, and that she'll come around and say hi to him if he does that. And I'm sure he set aside those tickets. I mean, who wouldn't want to say hi to Mata Hari? when she's you know, so famous and so fabulous. And we have that um, in our archive and we have a reproduction uh, on display. So Mata Hari continues dancing throughout Europe. She gets a little bit uh, you know, less popular. Um, and by the time um, World War I breaks out, she's, she's still dancing, she still commands uh, some fine sums, but she is not at the height of her powers, but she's still extremely well known. She's um, supposed to have a, a, a run of performances uh, in Berlin and um, the war breaks out and the Germans decide, so she is, remains a Dutch citizen, but she lives in Paris and she's strongly associated with Paris. So the Germans decide that, you know, she's an enemy, um, you know, citizen, and they confiscate all of her possessions. And Mata Hari is left high and dry in Berlin. Um, and let me tell you, this is a woman whose possessions we have uh, in our exhibit, a list of what she traveled with that uh, people who uh, were stopping her in her travels had to go through. And it's cases and cases and luggage and hat boxes. So she was pretty unhappy about this loss. She gets herself to a home she has in The Hague in the Netherlands and licks her wounds. And then this is when the part of her life when the spy masters come to call. Um, she is sought for recruitment by the Germans, the French, and the Russians over the next year or two. And I want to take a moment um, to tell you, uh, often you hear about Mata Hari. She wasn't really a spy. She didn't know what she was doing. It was all in her head. She was crazy. Well, and one of the things that I've explored um, in research is, well, then why did all these people approach her to spy for them? So I thought I'd take you through this very quickly. Some of the reasons why she actually makes sense as a potential recruitment. All right, she had mobility and a lack of allegiance. Uh, I should say, first of all, all these documents that you're gonna see for the next uh, few minutes, they are notes. Uh, she is arrested. I don't think that's a spoiler to tell you that she gets arrested. And um, these are notes from various um, interrogations uh, with her or notes that intelligence um, operations were taking on her and they um, mostly come from um, from the British archives. So she's a Dutch citizen. So um, the Netherlands were neutral during World War One. So that meant she could travel freely around Europe. She's not, and she, even though the Germans took her stuff, she's not uh, a citizen of a, a country at war. And she also doesn't have any allegiance. She considers herself, in her own words, an international character or woman. She is a global citizen, as we might say today. She does not feel particular allegiance, so that seems like maybe she'd come to work for you as an asset. She's multilingual. Um, this is an English document, and she speaks French, English, Italian, Dutch, and probably German. Um, this is from a time when she was stopped 
um, as she was traveling about in, um, in an English port. And everybody always seemed from the beginning of the war to think she was a spy, a person of interest. Um, she also had incredible access to people. Um, this is a list of some of the people that she thought could vouch for her, that she was, you know, a really was uh, Margarita Zell and, and not a, an adventurous and not a spy. So she's got access to all kinds of people. Uh, okay, and let's face it, she's sexy and she knows it. She is not afraid to flaunt this body. She has traded um, her sex appeal for, um, you know, houses and furs and what have you, horses, I was gonna say cars, but not yet. Um, and so the idea perhaps for these spy masters is if you'll trade, you know, if you'll trade sex you know, for your livelihood, you'll probably trade sex for secrets. And you may know the acronym MICE. Um, we talk about this in the spy biz. This is what a spy's motivation might be. It might be money, it might be ideology, it might be compromise, it could be their ego. Now, for Mata Hari at this point uh, in her life, it's definitely money. She's lived way beyond her means. Um, one of her um, very solid financial supporters, um, his wife had gotten pretty angry. She really needed some money. So she is, as I like to say, ripe for recruitment. And that's when Carl Kramer comes to visit. And this is in autumn of 1915. He's um, the honorary German uh, consul in the Netherlands, and he offers, offers her 20,000 francs to spy for Germany if she'll do something special for Germany. And um, she does agree. She does take the money. She always um, defended herself when this finally came out that she considered the 20,000 francs as payback for all of her glorious you know, furs and, and jewels that were lost in Berlin at the start of the war. But nonetheless, she agrees to spy. Um, she goes off. She actually has training with the, the famous and mysterious um, Dr. Elsa Schragmuller, this German spy mistress who um, spent some time with her and thought that this was a bad, that she was a bad idea as a spy because she could not keep, keep a low profile to save her soul. And my goodness, there was nothing about her that would have thought she would keep a low profile. She wanted all eyes on her. Um, they did train her to use invisible ink. This is a document where during an interrogation with the French, um, she talks about the invisible ink um, they taught her to use, but she says she dumped it in a canal and never used it. And Elsa Schragmuller also said they never got anything out of her. Maybe she would like send some piece of information that could have come from the newspaper. And mainly it was usually accompanied by the plea for a little more money. So she was not a good spy for Germany. But then this happens. Mata Hari falls, falls really, truly in love uh, with a young Russian uh, officer, a Russian soldier, Vadim Dimaslov. He is 21. He's about the age that her son would be had he lived. And she has a very, very different relationship with him. And, and she wants very badly to settle down with him. She feels like if she had a little more money, they might be able to convince his parents that this isn't such a bad idea. And that is when Georges Ladoux enters the picture. He is um, the head of the Deuxième Bureau Intelligence Service for the French. And um, in August of 1916, she and Ladoux cross paths. She is trying to get a pass to visit a resort town. You needed passes to move around. Um, it was closer to the front. She wanted to visit um, Vadim uh, there. And um, she says Ledoux approached her. His office was near the office where you would get the passes. Um, it's a he said, she said, he said she approached him. But either way, she agreed to spy for France. And her thought was, if you, 
I can get you some great intelligence. I know some really amazing people. If I bring you really golden intelligence, will you pay me 1 million francs? And she thinks this will then bankroll her life with um, Vadim de Masla. Ledoux says on the other um, on the other hand that he asked her to spy because he was he was always suspicious that she was a German spy and he was playing that you know keep your enemy closer. So and their dispute goes on and to a tragic end. So she is her plan for this million franc um, payoff is to head back to The Hague where she knows a very wealthy man that she thinks is gonna give her some good information about German war movements or what, what they are doing, but she doesn't make it, she is thwarted. You know, she just uh, is always under suspicion and she gets turned away at various ports and ends up in Madrid. And she really makes the most of Madrid because she, um, this is in November 1916, she set off. She meets up with the German army attaché um, and has quite a, a outrageous time with him. She um, seduces him with techniques unheard of in this day, playing with her feet. Um, she said she let him do what he liked to do and it as and somehow got out of him that there were um was a german sub um near morocco that the germans had broken the french radio cipher um and also um information about um germans invisible ink and how they carried it hidden under their fingernails so there are two thoughts of how she got this intelligence. She may have seduced him, she probably did seduce him and she's fully capable, but did he share this with her because she was already a known to him, German spy, or was she just that good? We don't know and we really, I don't know if we ever will know, but she's so excited. She feels like this is a million francs worth of intelligence and she is going to get it back to the do and earn her payday. She does not choose clandestine channels. She basically tells someone else that she meets at a party this information, pass it on, and not the most discreet of channels. Anyway, she goes back to France expecting a glorious payday, and instead she's followed, and on February 13th, 1917, she is arrested. This is her mugshot, and she cannot believe it. I mean, the people who arrested her actually let her go, like, and take a bath or gather her stuff. Like, everyone, no one knew what to do with it. She's this famous celebrity, and they're dragging her off to prison. She has a horrible um, situation. There, you know, fleas, and it's a bad, bad prison. Um, uh, Lazare, horrible conditions. She's pleading with the Dutch. Um, government to get her release. She's a Dutch citizen. No, nothing's getting anywhere. She has a lawyer who loves her, but he's very elderly. He doesn't know what's up. Chances are good that Ledoux set her up because after the war uh, or later, he was accused of being a German spy. Um, anyway, she, she goes through these endless interrogations and um, confesses to some of the things we've seen, the fact that um, you know, she had taken money from the Germans. She had been trained in invisible ink. It, it was it was quite clear that this was going to trial. Um, this is a, obviously just a depiction of the trial. It's it's um, as much that she was being tried for being um, a loose woman as for being a spy. Everything under the sun is blamed on her. She's a really handy scapegoat, why was France suffering all these losses um, in the war, taking so many casualties? Oh, here's here's the answer. It's this terrible, terrible woman spy. And um, during the July 1917 trial, one of the prosecutors said, the evil that this woman has done is unbelievable, unbelievable. And she is guilt found guilty on eight charges and she is sentenced to death and this is 
the death decree. It kind of takes your breath away. So on October 15th, 1917, she is marched out early in the morning um, to be executed by firing squad. Um, the public was not allowed to attend. This is the only known photograph. It's believed that this shows um, her execution. Um, the firing squad, it's the right of my screen. I don't know, but the, the people that are lined up opposite where the horses are, that is the firing squad. Um, she had been a wreck in prison, but during the trial and then on her way to this execution, she carried herself grandly. She drew upon all of her stage presence she moved with dignity. She refused a blindfold. And um, when they were about to fire, she blew a kiss to her lawyer and to a priest, and she died with great dignity. And one of the officers that was there at the time um, reportedly said, my God, that lady knows how to die. I find this picture very moving. So it's worldwide news. As I said in a little soundbite, it's like Lady Gaga got, uh, you know, accused of espionage and tried and then executed. We have an American paper um, on display at the museum. And, and lots of these articles also mentioned that she'd gotten away or someone who'd rescued her. I mean, her life seemed like such a fairy tale almost. And, and this tragic end, people didn't really sort of grasp how it could have really happened like that. So it's worldwide news. And so I think, and this is one of the main reasons we have her so prominently featured at the museum, um, she becomes this huge celebrity, this tragic end. Um, she probably would, it, it made her so famous and it got blended into this woman's spy brand and it and this femme fatale and feeling and i know a lot of women in intelligence really uh understandably struggle with this mata hari shadow some people think it's amusing i know folks who have their dogs named mata hari but then this is the sort of article that's so odd here is something from the washington post in 2007 it's talking about Valerie Plame, who was a, a senior CIA officer who was um, publicly outed. And they say, well, she was no Mata Hari, as though that's a compliment. People don't even know what it means, but it's still, it's sort of like, if there's a female spy, we're gonna mention Mata Hari. And here's one that really amuses me, because this is Anna Chapman, who was part of the Russian spy ring rolled up in uh, 2010. Her mother's like, she's no Mata Hari. Meanwhile, I, I think she was probably a lot closer to Mata Hari, although she had probably a ton more training than Mata Hari, but she was definitely someone who was using her fantastic good looks to get close to people. So that's um, that's why we really um, chose her. It's because it, we still know her name over a hundred years after her death. And it's such a tragic story. She builds this brand and then she falls so far. And um, I'm so interested in her. And I, I hope you all were interested too. And I am excited to answer any questions. That was fantastic, Amanda. Thank you so much. Um, the first question I have actually is just um, what book would you recommend if anyone's interested in reading and finding out more about Mata Hari, um, which ones would you recommend us looking to you know um pat shipman's book um is really good it is doesn't have the latest um information a little bit more has come out since she wrote it um but i it she cares about Mata Hari. there's a there's a pretty new book um where i Feel like the woman really hates Mata Hari. Um, Paul Coelho has a novel. I haven't read it because I've, you know, read stuck with the uh, um, with the history. I don't want to get lost in the fiction. So I would go with Pat Shipman's book. And then if you're a real nerd, Julie Wheelwright is one of the first people to look at her kind of with a feminist lens. 
And um, so that's a long winded answer. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, I've got a bunch of great questions coming in. <laughs> um, and oh, one of the questions uh, I've got here is um, we have someone who's uh, curious about um, where um, and how the museum collected uh, some of these artifacts. Well, we have an incredibly wonderful board member, Keith Melton, who um, has generously um, given us and continues to give us um, a number of the things we have on display. Um, the dance bodice um, was something that he has given us. He's and a newspaper clipping and a, and a second letter by Matahari. I believe um, the museum, right before we opened, about 18 years ago, we bought the letter. You can buy Matahari letters. They frequently come up, um, you know, because she wrote a lot and signed a lot. Um, and then the the theater program, uh, I actually bought uh, for the for the museum from uh, uh, like European eBay or something. Great, thank you. And then um, another wonderful question, uh, which I've wondered about. How did she come up with her stage name, Mata Hari? I should have said that, but thank God I didn't say everything, right? Um, it means eye of the sun um, in, um, in Javanese, I think. That's the language. So she just, you know, she was drawing upon that time living in the Indies with Rudolph. Okay. Um, and is there uh, a documentary film about Mata Hari out there? You know, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube. Um, and there, um, someone recently contacted me who has a, a good film that she was trying to, it's been on kind of like the, the film festival circuits and it's really quite good. And we were in conversations about maybe showing it at Spy and then something happened wonder what that was. And so that's on hold. Uh, so that's not quite out yet, but there's not, there's not a lot I would write that I love that's out there because okay. they repeat a lot of the fictions and we've tried so hard to get as close to the story as we could, which is tough. And then switching gears a little bit, um, do you know um, about her daughter and the extent of her awareness of her mom's life yeah um non uh, that was her her nickname certainly you know she lived with her dad she stayed in the netherlands very pretty girl i think she was about 20 when she died um and it was really sad because like none of matahari's estate um you know got you know it, it was all kind of confiscated and there was a little, uh, there's a little pin that she had wanted to have go to Nan, like nothing got to her. And it's interesting. I saw at, uh, at auction a few years ago, um, a document, it was uh, like a postcard of her, you know, something like this, you know, a, a souvenir shot. And it belonged to her ex-husband and he had written on the back her you know her death date and something along the lines of like she didn't deserve that which you know as awful as their relationship was i i found that that was very sad i thought and very moving yeah uh got a bunch of questions are all coming in right now which is great i'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep drinking because i've done the heavy lifting on you it. did you did it's all easy from here um i've got one question about um do we know what happened to that young Russian officer who stole her heart? Yeah, you know, he um, he did seem to love her. I, I was, you know, he was not there for her during the trial, but it's unclear that he ever got any letters. It's also unclear if she really wanted him to, to see her in this state. He, um, you know, survived the war and went back, um, you know, to the, what became the Soviet Union. And he got, he, is lost to time due to the Russian um, revolution. No one really knows what became of him. Okay. And um, how old was she when she was executed? Um, she was 39 years old. 
just, yeah, did not make it to 40. And so, one thing that particularly annoys our, our dear friend and uh, curator, Alexis Albion, is everyone kept saying, she was losing her lick. look, she was so old, her hair was graying, she looked terrible, and, and Alexis is like, but she wasn't even 40 yet. And I'm like, think how I feel, I'm even older. <laughs> uh, yep. <laughs> Um, oh, this is a, a really interesting question. Um, do you think she was the most influential female spy in history, or were there others before her that laid the groundwork for her? Well, you know, in the U.S., we had lots of really um, interesting female spies who who really were moving and and doing. Rose Greenhow, lots of people who were really focused on what they were doing. The, the thing about Mata Hari is. She was in it. She's just in it for the money. So um, she's. I think what she is is just this powerful image, you know, that that makes us think of the, you know, the seductive spy, which is is what we call her. Um, so not influential, but someone that just like, you know, they use that, you know, they use those two words, Matahari, like shorthand for female spy. So that's why we want we wanted to drill down on who she really was. Yeah, and then um, I've got a couple of folks who are interested. Um, do we know where she's buried? No, you know what? Um, they lost like they lost her head. It's quite terrible. Her head belonged to like a scientific, you know, a French governmental scientific agency, and I think it's gone missing. I mean, so. Yeah, no grave, as far as I know, you know, body went to science. I mean, just because you can, I, I mean, don't you imagine some grave like Oscar Wilde's or, you know, Jim Morrison's or, you know, some, you know, where people make a pilgrimage because wouldn't you think I'd have been there by now? <laughs> I, you would, you would have, yeah. <laughs> um, and then um, another question I've got here. Uh, do you think that her fame led to her downfall in an indirect way, or was it more she just was not a particularly good spy? I think um, had she, okay, a couple things led to her downfall, one of which is, of course, that she flaunted her sexuality, and she was, you know, very much took care of herself and got ahead, and that might have been okay in glamorous, frivolous France. That was not okay during wartime. That's when you want your women to be like home and hearth and caring and devoted. So there's a huge um, about face to, you know, what's glamorous at one minute looks really terrible during serious times. Um, the other uh, situation that led to her downfall was um, the Germans had executed um, an English nurse, Edith Cavell, who had been um, uh, serving in Belgium behind enemy lines. And she was, you know, um, smuggling people out to safety, soldiers out to safety. And um, the Germans apprehended her and they actually executed her. And she was a, a you know, a nurse, a middle-aged woman. And they, you know, this is, got a lot of international backlash. This was not a good thing to do. So um, it's interesting. I talked to a German scholar when it became, when more information was coming out and became clear that Matahari, you know, really had spied for the Germans. I, I naively said, why didn't Germany, why didn't they claim her? She really was a spy. And they're like, oh, you know, it makes Germany look much worse if the French have now executed an innocent woman. So, you know, it's just, you know, she was tit for tat in a way. You know, if you will kill a woman, we'll kill a woman. And then everybody can look bad that they've killed an innocent woman later on. Although she didn't deserve to die, but she wasn't innocent. Got it. Thank you. Um... I'm going to kind of, there's a few questions here asking um, a little bit about movies. So I'm going to combine a few of these questions folks mm -hmm. have here. Um, so uh, are there any depictions in media that you think are particularly accurate or are they all mostly myths? Um, and then as part of that, um, do you have a favorite portrayal of Matahari in TV and movies? Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, the Greta Garbo, is, it's so funny to watch that. And that's great fun. And you just, you know, if you can get a hold of it, um, do watch it. But seeing her seductive dance, it's like, that's not seductive to me or even looking like Mata Hari. It's, it's very funny, but it, it, and it, she's shooting people and she's much more, you know, on, you know, in it and, you know, really kind of harsh, but does fall in love with this young man. The sets of that are glorious to see. Um, the French movie with Jean Moreau, age 21, is quite fun to watch. Um, and then gets really odd, like the ending gets very odd, but it's kind of like light and she does all kinds of capery things, um, kills a bunch of people, scales some incredibly high spots. Um, you know, nothing's really close to reality. Um, trying to think. Uh, yeah, those are the two big movies. There's a Russian series that um, I can't vouch for. I've watched a lot of clips of it. So, but they're fun. They're fun to see, but nothing adheres to the story. Got it. Watch that Korean um, musical. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I really like this question uh, here. If you could dispel one myth about Mata Hari, what would it be? Um, that she was crazy. She was not crazy. You hear, I've, I've heard people say she just didn't know what she was doing and just, she really was um, a woman who was under a great deal of duress, who created herself. Things changed. We're experiencing a world that has changed dramatically for us right now. So all her livelihood, you know, this kind of glamorous life she was used to disappeared. Um, she was just trying to make money in another way. And she was so used to triumphing with her personality and her charisma. And so I'd like people to remember, uh, you know, that she's someone who created a brand that survives today, if that makes sense. So she's, there's just a lot more to her than, um, than you would think. Yeah, absolutely. And then, um, oh, I, all right, this I one. Don't know uh, to, I don't know what to think about that. Oh, Shauna. Uh, I know. Well, it's, um, this has a little bit of intrigue. Do, do people think um, that the French man who approached her about spying for France actually set her up um, yes. and that he was really a German spy? Yes, yes. Ledoux, um, he was accused of being a German spy. They kind of seems like they just kind of made that go away because no one really had the appetite for it. He was definitely demoted. I mean, some of the, I didn't want to get into the deep weeds on the trial, but I mean, there were like, there were all these incriminating um, radio messages, but he's the only one who like got them. And they also were on a line that France already knew was, uh, interceptable by German. Oh no, they were. Uh, it was, I'm not explaining this well, but anyway, it looked like very easily like cooked up evidence. Like nobody had seen the original. It were, they were German messages, and they were sent on the line that the Germans knew the French could read. Did that make sense? Are you there, Shauna? I'm there. Okay. Yeah. So just it looked like the evidence was cooked a little bit and you know, and he was uh, covering his own activities. Got it. Okay. Thank you. And then um, this is an interesting question about what uh, drew you to uh, Mata Hari um, and true this to this career in history? Well, I um, am really interested in um, in women's history. And I confessed to a good friend, friend of mine this morning that I went as Mata Hari for Halloween when I was in high school. So I, I think that I was really interested in, um, you know, in these beautiful posters and graphic arts coming out of, of Paris. Uh, Josephine Baker was another person I really was intrigued by, and it's all these beautiful um, depictions, Toulouse-Lautrec, that whole life and that period, um, I was very interested in. 
So I get very drawn to people. My career has, you know, always been um, history related, but it might be, you know, the history of African Americans in in Maryland or, you know, it's but people really draw me in. So was there anything specific about Mata Hari you think that really drew you to her? Um, Oh, I, you know, I love these images. I, I mean, I just, I could look at these images of her all day. I'm just, she's just, you know, posing herself. I just am so intrigued. I guess she's so ahead of her time because we all now, you know, if you have any young people in your life or are a young person, you know, I mean, my kid gets up first thing in the morning and, you know, he's, you know, posing these, you know, Instagramming or whatever he's on. And she, you know, she was doing that in, you know, 1908. You know, she was ready. She would have been on Instagram nonstop, you know, here's my breakfast. Um, so it's just kind of intriguing. There are just so many photos of her in so many walks of life. So that's why I wanted to share a few of her, like, you you don't think of it, but here she is in the giant hat. And here she is in the furs and here she is at the racetrack. And I've got a, I've had a number of questions um, interested in this, so I'm going to kind of summarize them here. But um, in terms of Mata Hari and the information that she, uh, you know, collected or the information that she was pass passing on, was any of it particularly helpful? Was any of it very um, actionable? Was there any actual really like crucial piece of information that was, you know, yeah, I mean, that? I don't, you know, they really because. Obviously, they Ledoux was planning whatever you know to set her up. Whether he was a German spy or not, he had a narrative that he wanted to fulfill, in which she was a German spy and he was capturing her. Um, so I think it was interesting information that she delivered to him. I don't think it was you know world shaking, but you know it was I think probably useful to have and maybe they'd gotten it from some other sources too it certainly wasn't bad but it wasn't like war changing or anything like that gotcha and um it looks like you've sparked the interest in uh one of our attendees when you were talking about um uh her body and uh being used for science so uh this question is saying um why would her head body be considered useful for science and then was there a particular reason or was this um, standard for bodies of people who would be killed via firing squad? You know, I have not drilled down on that. I kind of liked her better when she was alive. And um, I can can do some research. I just know her head went missing. I think it's like often they might use, um, you know, she's a criminal. You know, they might use criminal bodies for medical science, um, you know, for tests or like, you know, I, you know, I really am not an expert on that. I'm sorry to say, but I know the head went missing. <laughs> All right. And then um, also, is there any actual video of her? No, no, there is no there is no moving imagery. Um, there's some things that will say like, oh, this is actually Mata Hari and it is not her. And that's why I was went over that um, firing squad scene so closely because um, there's so many, oh, it's her execution. And it really, really isn't. I'd love to see her dance. I'd love to see a film of her dancing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and then, uh, Oh, do you think she would have gotten the money if she would have stopped spying? No, I think that her, I don't know if he knew he was going to get her the death sentence, but I think the minute Ledoux started tangling with her, he was like, I can probably shift any, you know, any issues that might arise about my own behavior over onto her. And I think he wanted a big win. I've caught a spy you know, I think that she was sunk. She might not have been executed, but, you know, she was cooked from the moment she met up with him. And then I think we're going to end it with this final question um, here. Uh, what's your favorite part of the Matahari exhibit 
at the spy museum that people should see? Oh, my favorite part. Well, you know, it's interesting because not everybody realizes if you haven't seen it, but we talk about Mata Hari. And then on the back of the exhibit, we talk about women in intelligence today because we wanted to make it clear that this is not, you know, that that women do all kinds of work in intelligence. And as a matter of fact, like in uh, American intelligence services, like you will be fired if you were to um, pursue any of the courses of action that Mata Hari did. So I am really proud of that whole sort of, you know, whole story about women. But I love the film that um, a colleague, Hannah Saloyo, and I put together that's featured in the exhibit and shows clips from all on the pop culture movies that show Mata Hari. And I know I did it myself, but I love it. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Amanda, thank you so much. That was really fascinating. I want to say cheers. Cheers. To you. Cheers. Thanks um, everyone for joining us. So, so wonderful. I want to say uh, thank you to Stonies and to Reese again, um, just for joining us and showing us all how to make uh, a Mata Hari cocktail. Um, and then finally, I want to just let um, everyone know and thank all of you for joining us um, this Thursday evening. Um, and I want to let you all know we actually have a number of upcoming programs. Um, we've, we've really just kind of kickstarted these public programs this week. Um, but what we're planning to do is next Wednesday, we'll have a spy trivia uh, at 530 that has limited registration. Um, so you want to sign up for that. Uh, and then next Thursday at noon, um, we'll be doing a spy chat with our executive director, Chris Costa, and um, our advisory board member, um, Steve Cash, where they will be talking about um, uh, current events and uh, current news stories. So if you have questions um, about what's happening, bring those. And then um, next Thursday evening, it will be our second Spies and Spy Masters happy hour, um, where uh, Hannah Saloyo will be talking about animal spies. Uh, so that should be that should be a lot of fun. Um, but thank you all for joining us tonight. I hope you all had a drink um, or something nice uh, to treat yourselves. So um, I just want to say cheers to all of you. Cheers to Amanda. Cheers, cheers. to Mahari. Thank you all. Be well, everybody. Be well. Yeah.